my main message for concomitant AF is really just do it. At uh, the excellent lunchtime session, we heard that the majority of people who wind up in a cardiac surgery operating room and also have AFib, the majority of them do not get their AFib treated. The surgeon at the time of other heart surgery has a once in a lifetime opportunity to treat the AFib. And if we squander that, we leave the patient with AFib. So just do it. Uh, my main disclosure is I took this from Nike. Those are their words. I have some other disclosures which are far less important than this one, which is for AFib, follow what they tell you with Nike. I mean, you can wear their shoes, you can wear their shirts. I don't know if they make tennis rackets, but just do it. Just do the ablation. And there are two points to that. Why should you ablate AFib? And then how should you ablate AFib? First, the why. Why do it? Why pay any attention to it? it? You don't get the same satisfaction as you do from fixing the mitral valve, look at the echo, and you say, I fixed it. You won't know for a while if you fix the AFib, but why do it? For the patient. Because ablation is effective at rhythm control, preventing strokes, freedom from anticoagulation is higher, and people who have an ablation for AFib, if it's successful, those people live longer. In addition, it is safe. It's a safe procedure. These are the key points behind the question, why do an ablation? And let's go through each one of them briefly. Rhythm control is easy. These are the results from eight different randomized trials of AFib ablation in people with mitral valve disease. So these are people going for mitral valve surgery, they had AFib, and if they had an ablation, they're in the green column and their freedom from atrial fibrillation or return to sinus rhythm is much higher than if the AFib was ignored. So in mitral valve surgery in particular, where the atrium is open, you've got that opportunity, ablate the AFib, you do a good job for rhythm. It's the same with other structural heart disease. If we look at aortic valve disease, this paper from Ralph Damiano, this is freedom from AFib with a standalone maze, the dark bars, and an AVR, aortic valve surgery, the white bars, at two years, about 80% freedom. And if we look at coronary artery bypass grafting, same kind of thing, freedom from AFib, red bars, and if you have an ablation, go out to five years, you're around 70 to 80% free from AFib. One point about these three structural heart issues, mitral valve disease, aortic valve disease, coronary disease, don't tell patients they're gonna have a 95% freedom from AFib. That's kind of the old figure where the follow-up went something like this. Hi, I'm calling from the doctor's office. You had a maze procedure about a year ago. How are you doing? Good, any AFib? Not that you know of? We'll check the sinus rhythm box. With real follow-up, it's probably 70 to 80% freedom from AFib after a couple of years, but that's still a lot better than you get if you don't address the AFib. So addressing the AFib restores sinus rhythm in the majority, and it's better than doing nothing. Addressing the AFib also helps with survival because if AFib is left untreated, patients are left with an increased risk of stroke and death. This is survival in patients undergoing mitral valve surgery based on whether or not they have AFib or they don't. No ablations here. Just if you have AFib, you get a good mitral valve operation, you're on the lower survival curve. Same thing with coronary artery bypass grafting. If you have AFib, even if you got all arterial grafts, you die early. So AFib causes reduced survival. Does treating the AFib shift the curve, meaning if we do an ablation and it's successful, do we make people live longer? We don't have randomized controlled data to answer that question, but we've got some pretty good series. This one from Pat McCarthy and Rick Lee, and here you see patients having surgery, untreated AFib, lower survival curve, treated AFib, survival is the same as if they had no AFib. So this suggests that doing an ablation that is successful shifts the curve toward better survival. Treating AFib, in addition to the appendage management, reduces the long-term risk of stroke. These are data from Ralph Damiano, who's written some excellent papers, and in their series, 15-year freedom from stroke was 99%. Other series suggest it's somewhat lower, but rest assured that managing the appendage and doing an ablation 
reduces the risk of long-term stroke in patients with AFib. In addition, it reduces the need for anticoagulation. This is a paper from NEVAD, and what I look at on this paper are the two curves on the bottom. That is the freedom from anticoagulation. And the majority of patients in their series had their anticoagulation discontinued. Those are the two lower curves. The two upper curves are the freedom from stroke and TIA. So what this curve is showing is a sort of a composite message. Most people get their anticoagulation discontinued, and in that setting, they have a very low risk of stroke and TIA, meaning we believe that after a successful maze procedure, you can discontinue anticoagulation and still have good freedom from stroke and thromboembolism. But is it safe? It adds to the surgery, and in general, one would suppose that adding to surgery must add to risk. And this slide was shown at lunch, but we know that less than half of people who go to the operating room with AFib get an ablation, and the question was why? To surgeons, why don't you do an ablation? And it was because it's complicated, it adds pump time, it adds risk. Basically, the overriding concern was adding an ablation leads to increased risk. This is what people thought. I'll tell you the answer to this right now is that's not true. It does not add to risk. This is a randomized controlled trial that we did uh, with the NIH, Cardiothoracic Surgery Trials Network. So these were very carefully monitored patients, about 260 patients. And when we look at serious adverse events, people who had mitral valve surgery alone in blue versus those who had mitral valve surgery plus ablation in red, there was no difference in perioperative events no added risk. If we look at MACE over the 12 months postoperatively, mitral valve surgery alone, again in blue, versus mitral valve surgery plus ablation, no increased risk. Mortality, additionally, no increased risk. And in fact, this was not statistically significant, but the ablation line had a little bit lower mortality, but I really can't say that because statistically not significant. The one thing that we did see in this trial was that the addition of ablation in red led to more pacemakers. This trial is a bit of an outlier. We had a very high pacemaker rate. We're looking at that, uh, and there will be a publication coming out about this. But I think it is correct to say that when you do an ablation with mitral valve surgery, you do increase the risk of needing a permanent pacemaker in the long term. But I think it's probably also correct to say that the patient is better off with an AV sequentially paced rhythm than he or she is with a fit. So pacemaker is not the end of the world, but there is an increased risk of pacemaker with ablation. On the big ticket items, though, stroke, death, MI, does adding a maze procedure increase risk? This paper, no incremental risk. This paper looking at AVR and cabbage surgery, adding a maze procedure, does it increase risk to add a maze procedure? No, it does not. And then I'll finish briefly with a couple comments here, which will be a good segue to the next talk. How should you ablate atrial fibrillation? And you'll hear a lot more evidence one way or the other. Uh, but based on my reading of the data, it's really PVI versus a biatrial maze. Pulmonary vein isolation, that means a lot of things. Just like maze procedure appears to mean a lot of things. But pulmonary vein isolation could be isolate all four veins individually, two separate islands to just do the whole back of the left atrium. It is likely true that the more you ablate, the more effective your operation. Where does the idea of PVI come from? It comes from this article in the New England Journal of Medicine, 1998, from Michelle Hassiger and Bordeaux. Their experiment on people basically asked the question, in those with paroxysmal AFib, where does it start? Where is the PAC that triggers the paroxysmal AFib? And they found 95% of the time, these little red dots, the triggering event, were in the pulmonary veins. No one has ever subsequently found that high a preponderance of AFib triggers in the pulmonary veins. There's no doubt the pulmonary veins are the single most important structures leading to triggering of AFib, but not 95%, almost certainly not 95%. Here's a subsequent study looking at people with persistent AFib, again mapping triggers, and each little dot represents a trigger. Again, you see they're clustered more in the pulmonary veins than anywhere else, but they are in other places too. 
In fact, 47% of these triggers were outside the pulmonary veins, 18% in the right atrium, 27% multifocal by atrial. So how does that fit with the Cox Maze 4 lesion set? In the left atrium, of course, we box out the posterior left atrium. We take care of all the pulmonary veins, their connections to the mitral annulus, left atrial appendage is managed with a connection to the left atrial appendage. So this takes care of a lot of the triggers in the left atrium and also interrupts macro reentrant circuits. In the right atrium, these three lesions, currently there are some variants, but at least one lesion to the tricuspid annulus is necessary because a lesion to the tricuspid annulus will interrupt typical right atrial flutter. And I think I'm gonna end with just this point. If we ask the question, should we do both atria or just the left atrium? This is a somewhat older study, but what it shows that your freedom from atrial fibrillation, if you do biatrial lesion set, you're on the green line, <clears throat> higher freedom than if you do just the left atrium or no right atrial lesions. So the more you ablate, the greater your freedom from AFib appears to be. So I'll end with this, in my opinion, for almost all people with atrial fibrillation, if you're talking about biatrial versus left atrial alone, the question is, should I do the right atrial lesions? And I think the answer is yes. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Riga, who's going to tell us a little bit more detail, I suspect, about when and where to do these lesion sets.